Welcome, everyone. So great to be here, even though it's a very short time. It's been wonderful to be up in Ulu, working with um, Finnish colleagues up there, and now um, coming through Helsinki and having a chance to, to spend some time with you. Um, oh, dear. Hang on. Um, I'm going to talk today about a project that I've been exploring, and, and it really is about this idea, you know, if we could ask children about their concerns and, and the way they feel about the climate crisis, what do they think they would say? Um, and in particular, I'm going to draw a little bit on some of the psychological eco-anxiety research work that's going on, which is becoming a very dominant discourse around, you know, this idea of children's concerns. And a lot of people are jumping in to the debate who maybe don't have the sort of experience we have, which is a very different way of thinking about children um, and their engagement with the environment. So what I've been trying to think about is how we can trouble these notions of eco-anxiety um, to theorise um, children's grief and hope differently. And also particularly, I uh, focus a little bit on the, in this talk around how can we help teachers and educators think about how they can manage um, children's concerns. So I start with, oh, hang on, oh, can I just, um, do you have a cloth? Because the uh, water yes. spat, spouted everywhere and I've got a bit of water going on around here. Thank you. Um, oh. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, just a little maintenance work here. Um, so, um, so I ask, I ask everyone to sort of think to start with, if we could ask children today how they felt about the climate crisis, what do you think they would actually say to us? Um, any ideas? Is anyone, what do you think are the sorts of things that children are thinking about at the moment? Fear, a worry, thinking about the future, you know, what does it mean for me when I grow up to be, an, you know, an older person? What about my children? You know, um, and I, and I'll go through and show you some of the research. And one of the things that's really interesting is that you know it's like whenever these ideas come up, um, you know, it's it's like it's been discussed for the first time. But actually, children asking children about their concerns of environment has been um, research has been done about this for quite a few decades. So I'm going to go back to the history of it and look at it. Um, and to just sort of share it with you. But also just to start with, I'm going to share a little video. Um, and this is uh, just to give a bit of background. Uh, we've been doing some what nature play research with children up in Queensland. And one of the methods that we use is we've been giving them iPads and allowing them to take the iPads home. And we've been very open-ended and just said to them, just, um, you know, take pictures or videos of of the environment um, and places that you play or places that you go as part of your everyday life. And then when they got we got the iPads back, we'd then sit and have a conversation with the children around what they had, right? Pretty standard sort of method. Anyway, one of my <clears throat> one of my um participants, Elke, who's four years old, when I opened up her iPad and looked at her um videos, I was sort of um very surprised. <laughs> and um and it, and it sort of started me on this road of thinking about, um, you know, what does the climate crisis mean for children? So I'm just going to quickly play the video for you. So this is Elkie. Okay. Okay. After a while, it will die. Like crows, animals, us. We will die. We will hold up. Everyone will die. I know that it's dying, but I know it every time. So <clears throat> beyond just the sort of shock of, wow, that's really intense, um, what I thought was really interesting here was was really the opportunity that she took at this moment. Here's a bunch of researchers who come in along going, oh, tell us about your nature play. And so instead she sends me a, a sort of, message you know through the ipad to me about how she feels like you know even to the point of you know you know stop asking us about you know our little nature play actually there's a big crisis going on you know uh, and it really really struck me that wow we need to be upping the ante around this research and really talking to children um a lot of the eco-anxiety researchers with 
you know, sort of young people, youth, um, younger adults, um, not so much talking with really young children. So I'm going to frame this, um, the, uh, the presentation today by going back and looking a little bit of literature, <clears throat> um, talking a little bit about delusional Western thinking in academia and why that's important in terms of our um, framing of eco-anxiety. Sort of having a little think about how psychologically eco-anxiety is being sort of defined and then so thinking about the impact of climate crisis on children and young people. Um, I'll also talk about this idea of asking children to fix the problem, um, which has been the sort of strategy in environmental education, get kids into action, get them planting trees, you know, this will, this will be the way that they can feel like they're contributing. Um, and I'm going to tell you why there's some reasons we should be thinking beyond that. And also um, reframing this notion of anxiety as care um, and what that might do and change the way that we think about um, working, especially in an educational context. So I'm going to sort of look through all through each one of these. But let me start off <clears throat> with delusional Western thinking. Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting for me is that um, in even though, you know, the United Nations continues to project and reveal to us that, you know, we're failing internationally to um, to fulfill any of our agreed limits um, in terms of, you know, um, carbon emissions and so forth around the world. In terms of Western capitalist thinking, we seem to have put ourselves into this very um, delusional space. And that is, on the one hand, we're driven by individualization and overconsumption drives, you know, essentially the ecological crisis. Um, so there is a des the human desire to accumulate wealth and consume resources um, to have a comfortable life. And... Um, on the one hand, and actually sort of embraced in all that notion of a comfortable life is to create a better life often for your children, a better life than you had. So it's all about, you know, setting them up and 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 having a uh, so that they can continue to, you know, prosper. So we have this idea. Um, so we have this sort of collective idea to make sacrifices um, or changes to stop the global warming. So we've got this we want all these things and we want to create a better life for our children. And then we have this thing of, oh, we should be making sacrifices and changing what we're doing because actually, you know, we're contributing to the um, to global warming. So it's like we're in this tension constantly between these two things. And I know, you know, even myself, you know, you do things and you go, oh, I shouldn't really have done that. You know, I, I'm trying to be an, a good a good citizen, a good ecological citizen, and I, I'm failing because I still want to have my car and I still, you know, like, so we're constantly trying to work. How can I do the things that uh, I want for myself, but also, you know, be a good citizen? Secondly, you know, the other thing that we've done, which is pretty delusional, is that we've named the current era the Anthropocene <laughs> um, as a way that to recognise, in fact, human mastery of the planet. Look at us. Look at what we've done. And we may have been set up in a negative way. Yes, the geological impact of our being is now going to be recorded forever in the history of the planet. Um and there's a couple of things that's attached to that. Firstly, you know, there's a particular type of human who's actually made all that impact. So we've universalized the notion of the Anthropocene too, is that all humans have contributed to this, you know, um, de degradation. And in fact, that's not all true. But the other thing is that paradoxically, even though we're saying that, look at us humans, look what we've done and look how much power we have, to change the planet, we realise that we're in unprecedented rapid changes where we actually, humans are totally out of control of being able to control what's going on. So in fact, we've started to realise at this time of climate change for the first time, really, that we can't use technology and science to, you know, get ourselves out of this. This is a bigger story. The planet itself, you know, has its own um it's its own process and and it's very hard for humans to control you know once it's out of control so what these um challenges reveal is that western imperialism neoliberalism and anthropocentrism 
manifesting as human exceptionalism is busy at work but it has challenges firstly because although we support the self-belief we are masters of the planet when this belief is tested it only reveals how deeply we are and always have been embedded in the planetary system and uh, that comes that comes sort of as a quote from Leslie Head and and she talks about that you know this sort of delusional um dream of you know uh, of western progress and the fact that you know we believe that we can sustain a better life for a succeeding generation is a belief that we can no longer hold and for many children this con you know in fact what we're presenting for them in terms of their future is conjuring up mo emotions of dread feelings of denial and fear so ironically here we are thinking that we've done all these things to create a better planet so that our children can have a better life and they're telling us you've betrayed us you have let us down because we're looking to the future and we feel that we don't have a good future because of what you've done um so in terms of um, eco-anxiety, one of the things that comes out of this often is this, as, as Hed had said here, Leslie, um, this, these emotions of dread, feelings of denial and fear. And I think this is really interesting because fear evokes in most animals a sort of flight or fight response. It's often assumed fear can lead to action. That is, you know, um, you know if you can, if you, if, if you think that something's a problem, that you then feel the need to respond to it. Um, and while fearful representation of climate change appears to be memorable and many initially initially attracts individual ac action, um, it, it essentially can also evoke a distancing and a disempowerment. So fear, you know, may stimulate you to do something it may also set you in a situation where it's so overwhelming um, that you then feel like it's beyond your capacity to do anything. And, you know, we call it the great turning away when people just give up because they feel so disempowered. Overwhelming fear, which is what, you know, we're starting to see in children during these precarious times, can in, induce strong feelings of denial, paralysis, um, and it's this... You know, but it's this sort of idea of the great turning away um, that that children are responding to, that they feel that adults haven't um, responded to their concerns. But it's not new, and I'm just going I'm going to show you in a minute some of the research that shows that these concerns that children have, you know, uh, uh, have been around for quite a while. So that leads me to this question of eco-anxiety, you know, children feeling um, fearful, um, feeling that there is no future. According to the American Psychology Association, eco-anxiety is the chronic fear of environmental catechism that comes from observing and seemingly irrevocable impact of climate change and the associated concern for one's future and of the next generation. So it's not just about what is happening, but it's also what could happen that eco-anxiety is, is judged on. And just as a sort of, you know, um, put this into context, you know, this is actually on the American psychology, um, you know, psychological list now. So they do have a checklist on how they diagnose eco-anxiety for adults, but also for children. Recently in the UK, they did a quick survey of child psychologists and they found that 30% of um, English psychologists said that they were diagnosing eco-anxiety to children um, Paul Hoggett, editor of the Climate Psychology on the difference um, on indifference to disaster, argues climate change and environmental destruction threatens us with powerful feelings of loss, guilt, anxiety, shame, despair that are difficult to beat and mobilise. Defences such as denial, distortion, which can undermine our capacity to get to grips with the issue. Though recently um, Hickman has argued, and I'll look at her research in a minute, that the climate crisis is so complex and lacks a clear solution that many believe it can lead to feelings of being overwhelmed rather than action. And this is really, you know, again, going back to this definition of fear. If, if the fear of the 
the disaster or what's happening, you know, going back to our yeah, animalness of that, you know, is it, you know, stand up and fight or flight? And essentially she's saying that, you know, the, the climate disaster has got to a point where mostly people are feeling like they can't um, respond. So, you know, is this new children being fearful, being concerned, you know, um, to start off with, one of the interesting things about the climate crisis on children and young people is that it impacts children, you know, health and well-being in two ways. Firstly, due to their fears um, about the crisis, but secondly, the impact of climate change on their physical bodies, such as increased pollution, heat waves, poor water quality, um, floods, food shortage, toxins, and so forth. So over the past two decades in the field of environmental education, global studies, future and urban studies, there's been a lot of empirical evidence focusing on children's concerns. Um, and these studies support the view children uh, on the whole are cynical, anxious, pessimistic about the state of the planet. So this study by Hutchinson in 1970, uh, 1997 uh, was a study of 650 Australian children, and he um, showed that they expressed feelings of citizen, all of those things, pessimistic. Connell, two years later, also reported young people were worried about the state of the environment and felt powerlessness. In 1999, Bazara asked primary age children in England and Mexico to draw um, the earth in 50 years, and they all depicted pollution, global warming, loss of species, lack of water, and said they were anxious and pessimistic. Then Hick and Holder in 2007, a decade later, with 11, 10 to 11 year olds in the UK, also reported the majority of children had negative perceptions um, uh, about the environment. Strife in 2012 repeated the study of these earlier studies again um, in Denver in the US and found that 80% of children were concerned about the destruction of nature and global warming. Um, children said they were sad, fearful and angry. Um, this was also supported um, in some of my own research, and these, this comes from Strife, and these are some of the, the comments that children were making. So this is 2012, so a decade ago. Um, in some of my own research um, leading up to children in the Anthropocene book, where we asked children to photograph, draw, and share with us the impacts of climate change on their places and their future, they also described in great deal detail the impacts of degraded environments um, on themselves and also the animals and, and others that they shared um, their neighbourhoods with. And their desire often was to see more political action and they wanted, you know, to be supported, to have hopes and dreams for a better future. Um, Stryfel also, in her research, um, asked children to draw pictures of what the planet would look like in 100 years' time, and majority of them drew pictures, you know, similar to this, of what they felt that, you know, that we were heading to total disaster. So responding to all of these studies in the, the sort of early 90s and mid-90s, um, so David Sobel coined a term at the time he called ecophobia. And he described children's environmental fears and argued to teachers that they needed to turn away from um, in exposing children to the global disaster because he believed that they were creating these concerns because it was too big and too overwhelming. You know, too, much, too many pictures of polar bears on icebergs and too many big stories of disaster. And it was out of sight of their abstract understanding and therefore it was, um, you know, creating these fears. And his idea was that we needed to move away from environmental education, um, which was about distant global issues, and bring it back to the local. And he talked about that it was important that children, rather than feeling overwhelmed and powerless, that we needed, and, and we risk creating apathy, that we needed to create everyday actions for them. And while I agree children are worried and concerned, um, 
I'm not sure phobia, a, a for a start, I think phobia was a bit misleading in the use of that term because when we think of a phobia, we think of something that, you know, we're scared of and we're, you know, we 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 don't want to be exposed to. And so to call it ecophobia more or less meant that they had a, a disconnect from nature. And of course, we had this whole sort of then discussion about the idea that, you know, these concerns were connected to nature being seen as this, you know, um, terrible, destructive thing. Whereas actually, um, and it's very anthropocentric, very human-centered, you know, this idea we're separated from nature. And, and he was more or less saying that this is what children wanted so that they would feel um, less fearful. But my experience with children in my research has been more that they're less anthropocentric in their concerns um, and that their concerns stem from a care for nature as opposed as a fear of nature. And I think it's a really important distinction to make. Um, so recently, um, in the last, um, you know, five years, we've seen this huge, big, um, you know, beginning of research around eco-anxiety. And so ecophobia, you know, David Sobel stuff, um, turned into what we would see in environmental education, you know, building veggie gardens, doing tree planting, that sort of local actions. Then in the last um, decade, we've seen a shift from ecophobia to this idea of eco-anxiety. So it's replaced that um, position. The biggest research project, I suppose, that's going around at the moment was the done, done by Hickman. Um, she's from the University of Bath and her colleagues. She's looked at 10,000 children, 1,000 children in each of these 10 countries, um, slightly older age than the research that I've just shared with you, which was mainly primary school and early secondary. This is sort of later years, 16 to 22 year olds. Um, by far the greatest, uh, largest study ever capturing children's concerns about the planet, including the scale, extent and impact of adults climate in action. So she not only asked them how they felt, but also um, whether she felt that adults um, were doing enough in terms of uh, responding to their concerns. And you can see there overall across all of the countries, you know, most of the children, at least 50%, um, identified that climate change was causing them anxiety and fears. Um, they felt powerless. They were pessimistic. Um, and they also felt like climate change was affecting their everyday lives. Just to give you an idea, this is um, this is from the Finnish um, group. So there were a thousand children in Finland that were part of the study, and theirs was um, pretty much similar to most of the Western countries. You'll note that in their study, they included um, a couple, um, they included Mexico, uh, oh, Nigeria, India, and the Philippines. And one of the reasons why they included those countries is because those children are actually experiencing climate change in a more everyday reality. And, and it was very clear that those children's um, levels of anxiety were much higher. So they peaked at around 60 to 70%. But what I think was interesting about the Finnish study, besides that most of them are very similar to the other Western countries, was that they're, the place where they're most highest, as you can see, they've peaked, is that they felt that adults had failed them. And I think that was a really interesting takeaway. Um, <laughs> So this study is the first one to offer how young people's perception of government responses to climate change is associated with their emotional and psychological um, responses. The study focused mostly on trying to understand these psychological responses and how they're manifesting. She uses psychological analysis and terms. She doesn't theorize it from what we would see as a child-centered approach or even a you know post-human non-human non approach. She doesn't bring any of that um, into the discussion. Um, but one of the things that I think was really interesting, for example, more than half of the children from the Philippines, um, which is one of the nations in my region where children are experiencing rapid sea levels and flooding and devastating um, cyclones, is that those children in those sorts of countries who were actually experiencing climate change now 
talked a lot more about the fear of their families and their security and also their ability to sleep, study, eat, play. They talked about fun the impact it was having on their functioning of their sort of everyday lives. Whereas I think in from the Western children's, you know, perspectives in the more developed nations, the higher income nations, it was more about the potential of what was going to happen as compared to what was going on for them. So the results, you know, when you looked at them, you know, showed quite disturbing scale of emotional effects of the climate crisis on children, if you looked at it from a psychological perspective and also the impact of adult portrayal on children. Hickman reports that respondents rated governmental responses to climate change negatively and reported greater feelings of portrayal than reassurance and that many of them said their climate anxiety and distress was correlated with inadequate government responses and feelings. So even though these, you know, um, these, in these are interesting and dramatic results and she's used them, published it quite a lot and it's become quite the sort of focus around um, how to respond to climate change and how it's affecting children. There's a couple of things here that started to be a bit red flag for me um, and, you know, and maybe we can talk about these because to me, having been in education and childhood studies for quite a long time, every time we start to get a label, you know, presented and put on children as a disorder or a diagnosis, it starts to really worry me, you know, um, and, you know, while children talked a lot about the impacts on their families and you know on, and how it was affecting them uh, thinking about their future because it was identified as a psychological problem an emotional problem that children were having it was always it's still positioned as a deficit you know it's positioned as a problem or a disorder and ironically, as we know, conditions like ADHD, depression and anxiety, and many of these were identified as being in, you know, part of the anxiety. So if a child's got eco-anxiety, they're likely to have anxiety around a whole lot of other things as well. Um, is that, you know, ironically, you know, over the last 10 years, we've seen this explosion of that when children have disorders or, you know, identified as having these deficits like depression and ADHD, you know, we prescribe nature, <laughs> which is ironic, um, as the prescription drug, you know, vitamin N, you know. Um, and so, you know, and and children, are, you know, teachers are told that, you know, taking children out in nature and, and green spaces, doesn't matter what's in it, just stand out there for 30 minutes if you've got ADHD and your symptoms will suddenly, you know, start to subside. Um, so ironically, you know, um, once again, we have a situation where we're using a psychological framework to identify a problem with children and then, you know, you know, saying, well, what can we do to relieve their concerns? Besides reiterating an anthropocentric view of nature, these types of prescriptive activities that we've seen that we're using to respond to children's anxieties disguise the actual problem. And I've always argued, you know, I go to conferences all the time and, you know, I'll be one keynote amongst many and and all the keynotes before me will, will be about children and depression or the medicalization of, you know, children's disconnect from nature and we need to take them out more and stuff like this. And, and I get really concerned that when we see this as an easy, you know, solution, children with problem, nature will fix it. Um, that we decide the actual problem. You know, for me, children get depressed, anxious and ADHD in the classroom is because the classrooms are terrible. You know, no child should be made to sit in a classroom for eight hours a day, not moving, staring at a screen, being told to, you know, not have any engagement with their bodies and stuff. Yes, nature helps because it's so, you know, dis, you know, so outside of this terrible experience they're having inside of the classroom. Of course, they're going to feel better when they're outside. But Yes, being outside is great, but what we're not doing by creating these prescriptive drugs of nature is that we've forgotten that what we're actually doing to children and making them do in classrooms is the problem. That's the problem. So this, I feel, is the same with the eco-anxiety. Here we go again. We're going to start prescribing, oh, a way to alleviating anxiety 
And really what's been coming up is, you know, psychologists on their, you know, these are the symptoms of eco-anxiety and how to reprieve eco-anxiety in children is telling parents and teachers to give children more exposure to nature. We'll, we'll help them um, alleviate their concerns. So do we keep blaming the child as dysfunctional? Well, I suppose that's the question for me. You know, eco-anxiety is a problem that they have. Um, is it at risk of being just named as another psychological condition um, that we're at risk again of disguising the real problem? That is why are children feeling this way? Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is that asking children to fix the problem is not the answer. Um, and feeling these, you know, emotions um, to me is what we've got, uh, where we need to move with this is that with this understanding that, you know, that feeling emotions, feeling concern is not because you have a deficit. In fact, it's because, you know, you're being affected by the environments that you're exposed to. Um, much of the, you know, research around climate change education particularly in recent years, has suggested the best response for young people is to engage children to spend more time in nature and also to take individual action. Even recent strategies by the UK Royal College of Psychologists on how adults should respond to children's environmental distress, um, which included helplessness, anger, insomnia, panic attacks, included encouraging children to spend time in nature, to tell children their emotions are positive signs and encourage them to engage in environmental actions. While these strategies are valuable, then I certainly wouldn't say taking children outside or getting them involved in local actions is not a good thing. Um, what it does show that is that we continue to, to um, put the problem back on children. You know, you need to fix up, you know, the planet. You know, this is part of your, your treatment. Um, and Hickman argues, for instance, that thinking a way to cure anxiety uh, is eco-action isn't right. It's a simplified solution that doesn't address the real problem, and that, she says, is the need for governments to act um, urgently. And it's not just the acting urgently that's what children need. It's being able to see that adults are taking this seriously, and that's really what I see is the core of a lot of the children's anxiety. Hickman suggested protecting the health and well-being of young people, those in power, should be reducing young people's stress by recognising, understanding and validating their fears and pain and acknowledging their rights um, to be part of the discussions on what's going on. She says, before we can offer the young generation a message of hope, we must first acknowledge the obstacles. And some of those which she talks about is these issues of of the failure of governments to adequately um, identify the moral injury that they're causing through the injustice of not responding to their fears. Um, um, and Hickman argues that she says, and this comes from one of her um, participants who said, I think it's different for young people. For us, the destruction of the planet is personal. She believes young people are grieving for a future planet where humans alongside other earth beings um, can thrive. So what does this mean? Um, if we think about that, you know, children are feeling these levels of distress, um, one of the big answers we've always had is to engage children in local actions and, you know, engage them in, you know, uh, tell them that, you know, don't worry about the big picture, governments are doing all that stuff, your job is just to, you know, um, feel safe and happy in your own homes. To me, this is a very simplified solution, and I still don't think it gets to the core. And that is this, you know, importance around care. Um, Pew de la um, Bacasa describes care as flourishing livability. This acknowledges the closeness of relations as providing possibles for encouraging awareness and a means for creating new knowledge. Um, to be concerned there, so a lot of the discussion around children's environmental responses has been about that children are concerned about the environment. And I think that we should shift the terminology to talk about that children are caring for the environment. 
rather than just a concern. So the intention for many children, I believe, is that they not only care for themselves, but they care for others and are being touched by the possibilities and the vulnerabilities of all that they're on the planet with. And while concern is care related, to be concerned is to be affected, to care joins together an effective state of care with a dynamism of doing and putting that care into practice. Um, Velikasa says, care is required in processes in which humans and non-humans co-train each other to love, work and play together to construct a relationship of significant otherness. Um, Laurie Gruen maintains that care relations that are tuned with the needs, interests, desires, vulnerabilities, hopes and unique perspectives of Earth dwellers shows how we are already entangled as kin. So along with care is this notion of reciprocity and responsibility. So if we've moved from concern to care, we also start to build a sense of connection to the notion of our relations with the earth and the planet. And of course, many Indigenous and First Nation communities understand this mutual obligation and adhere to these ethical relations. So ethical kin relations means caring for the earth, including the land, sea, waterways, animal, plants, and all that makes up the cosmos. Joanna Macy, now you might not know Joanna Macy's work. Joanna Macy is a US, uh, nods over there. Yes, she um, she's like, I think she's like nearly 90. She's an amazing scholar from um, who, who's written. She actually, um, you might be familiar with the Council of All Beings, you know, that um, workshop process that you do where you engage children or participants to take on the role of different beings in a forest and then you talk about the that they have to talk through those um, identities but Joanna Macy actually wrote about hope and care um, in response to global crisis when um, the cold war was on and there was you know the threat of nuclear um, attacks and so she was doing research in the US, US around how that was affecting children's um, concerns and I've gone back to Joanna Macy's work because there's something really unique about the writing that she did, because even at that time, she talked a lot about the relationship between care, hope, grief and healing, um, which I think is a really important part of this story. Um, Joanna Macy tells us feeling pain within the enormity of a global crisis is natural and healthy and that we and children who feel pain and anxiety because as compassionate entities deeply connected with the earth we care you know um the conspiracy of silence concerning our deepest feelings about the future of our species the degree of numbing isolation burnout and cognitive confusion that result from it all converse to produce a sense of fertility each act of denial, conscious and unconscious, is an addiction of our powers to respond. So in other words, what she's saying is that the more that children are, you know, pushed aside, their feelings and concerns are validated, and we don't um, understand that these are deep feelings of care, not about just themselves, but the planet, that we're actually putting them into more and more sense of, you know, of being what we might have called in the past disempowerment or, or feeling unable to respond. Hickman also argues feeling anxiety or worry is about caring for the planet. And she talks about in her research this issue of, um, oh, there we go, um, this issue of the feelings of the moral and ethical position and that we need to shift from a psychological position. Hickman actually in her research calls this the moral injury um, of clim the climate crisis on children's imagination and explains moral in injury is a sign that one's conscious is alive. So, you know, what we're starting to see here is a shift from a psychological disorder that's diagnosed and we've got to try and cure children with their anxiety so they don't freak out too much and we can't, you know, get them doing the things we want them to do, to saying, whoa, 
actually this this these feelings are actually showing the sort of moral injury that they're carrying the injustices that they feel and the ethical relationships they have deeply with the planet um and from that that's where their care and concern is coming from um she talks, she talks about this idea of moral as a um, moral injury injury is a sign of the for children, it inflicts considerable hurt and wounding when they see adults, including governments, are transgressing fundamental moral beliefs about care, planetary health, and ecological belonging. And that was uh, yeah, the climate action I'm sure you've seen and, and walked alongside of young children in these situations. And it seems to me this is really interesting that this moral injury and moral consciousness that children are um, starting to you know, become aware of in themselves and with their, you know, with their peers has started to show, you know, through this political action that they're doing this, this ethical care of relations that they want to be able to express the transgressions that they feel that the governments have showed um, and portrayed them. Hickman advises if children ask questions about climate change, first to find out what they know and then tell them that it's a brilliant question and that they should feel proud of those feelings and concerns. Feel, but because feeling anxiety and worry is about caring for the planet. Parents and adults instinctively want to protect their children from painful, scary and traumatic um, so for many, climate anxiety is very distressing. Um, but one of the most important things, I think, is that we need to understand that is it's not irrational. It's not irrational emotional feelings that children are, are feeling. In fact, um, when a 10-year-old child asks, um, and this um, comes from Macy, is it true that in 100 years the earth will be burned to a crisp? You know, it's not fantasy. <laughs> it may well be the case to feel essential for our survival having those feelings and acknowledge them is actually fundamental you know I mean let's not scare the bejesus of our children and not say there's not a future but let's not deny that we are in a in a in a difficult and and we are in a crisis um repressing or hiding our fears requires tremendous energies uh, and vitality and dulls our minds and spirits so do we support and validate their fears or do we try and you know hide it push it away try and um, control it um delving deeper into our shared pain and opening to the deep interconnection bonds us to others including other living things um and as Macy and Hathaway say, you know, um, part of regenerating children's um, spirit and connection is to validate the fact that they still have that connection to the earth. And maybe many adults have, have you know, repressed, denied that connection and therefore they, you know, then they no longer see or feel it. So... When I'm sort of thinking about all of this, so this is sort of the background research. Now, I'm like, what do you do with this? You know, how do we move forward? And really, I've thought about three things that I think we need to be supporting in terms of children and climate change action, uh, education and research. Um, and I'm going to go through each one of those quickly. I hope I've got time. I haven't looking at, been looking at the time. Um, lots of time. Good. <laughs> okay, so the first I'm going to look at non-anthropocentrism and how we nurture that, intergenerational thinking, and then hope and healing as an act of enchantment. Um, so the first one is nurturing non-anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism is a social, cultural, and ecological artifact of Western industrial society and Western thinking. Um, Many ecologists, eco-feminists, eco-philosophers, conservationists and Indigenous people have over centuries recognised the limitation of anthropocentrism and have argued human beings are in community with other species, whether or not they recognise it, whether or not they want to believe that's the case, you can deny it, but it's inevitable. We are in an ecological relationship with all beings and other things that exist on the planet. Many would argue the failure of Western society to seek out ancient wisdom and practices from Indigenous and First Nation people who have survived and adapted over thousands of years to major ecological challenges. 
by living with and listening deeply to the earth um, is part of our denial. So, you know, colonization has actually put us in a position where we had access to those ancient knowledges. And of course, we've um, pushed them aside through our own um, desire to not acknowledge our indigenous um, humans who live along the planet with us. For many Western thinkers, including actually cognitive psychologists, ironically, so the psychologists seem to be at the root of a lot of this thinking, have always argued that anthropocentric thinking is innate in children from birth. Uh, now, I've never believed that in my entire research career, and I've probably spent most of my research showing that that's not the truth. Um, but in recent times, the studies in more diverse non-Western societies have showed and are starting to show that that's not the case. So um, this goes all the way, of course, back to Piaget. Piaget made some really strong claims in the 50s and 60s that all children are born anthropocentric, human-centered in their way of thinking. And he connected that to the idea of the ego. He connected that to the idea of individualization. He connected it to this, this sense that when and 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 actually in biology and biology thinking and evolution biology, they they talk a lot about this idea that um, that how you make sense of other beings and other species is through um, a comparison with your own self as a human, and and that's been seen as an indication of our anthropocentrism. That is, we only know other animals through our own experience of being human. So humanness becomes the sort of scale of which we make comparisons now of course you know the human pyramid you know where human species is on the top and everything you know comes down in terms of intelligence and knowledge you know down this thing you know has for centuries been you know argued against you know and the deep ecologists talked about ecocentric ways of thinking you know um we now science has sort of caught up and said, oh, well, you know, animals have knowledge. Animals can think, you know, the old idea that only humans could use tools. Well, you know, that's been put to the side. You know, animals, other species don't have those familial relationships. You know, we see that's not true either. So we created a story around what the human story was as being the master and being, uh, you know, alternative outside of nature and this sort of exemptualism human exemptualism that is we're exempt from the ecosystems that we live in just sort of supported that anthropocentrism um so research um as it as we start to see if you go back in the history of where anthropocentrism you know as as innate to children comes from shows that the research was done only in western academy in western society and it's only been the last decade which seems a long lag when research now supports that anthropocentering varies according to children's age their experience of nature and the cultural assumptions that they've been exposed to so religion cultural practices the sort of education and also the place of humans um, in the natural world that they might be exposed to so studies involving children from Indigenous communities, for example, show that they have no anthropocentric or very little anthropocentric behaviours from a very young age. Um, as an example of this, um, you know, this was some research I did with uh, children in La Paz. And um, when I asked the children about their, you know, their connection to nature, they say, you know, we live and eat from the land, Pachamama is our mama mother and we have respect for her um in a study with four to five year old children in australia we asked children if they were nature and almost all the children were not influenced who weren't influenced by teachers and adults actually teachers kept trying to tell them how to answer the question and we had to sort of take them aside to really talk about it but many of them said that they believed they were nature and that they were an animal now you know in biological terms, this idea of living, non-living, animal, human, you know, these binaries, again, has been shown to say that this is how children think about nature. It's an educational, they learn this through education. So 
Um, in a recent study with my Indigenous colleague, Sarah J. Moore, so I could show you lots of research, but there's lots of research now that's been done with children in countries who come from the countryside, even, even if they're Western societies, but if they've lived in the country, that they tend to have non-anthropocentric perceptions and beliefs. If they're Indigenous, they're also um, way more non-anthropocentric. And that anthropocentrism um, increases over time with age. So the younger the children are, the more non-anthropocentric they tend to be. But of course, once they get into a schooling system where we start to teach them the taxonomies of animals and humans and the disconnect, that they will start to you know, take on those cultural nuances, which is anthropocentrism. So um, in a study that um, myself and uh, an Indigenous colleague, Sarah Jane, we explored non-anthropocentric engagement with pre-language Indigenous and non-Indigenous toddlers. So my idea was that we had to go all the way back before abstract thinking and language to see if we could actually see non-anthropocentrism through the way children use their bodies in the natural environment. Um, and at the end of our studies, um, we wrote children's bodies, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who through their sensorial openings find space to be the, with the world beyond humanist limits imposed by anthropocentric positions that humans are except, except, exceptional bodies outside of other beings. In other words, we came to the conclusion that anthropocentric thinking is a social, cultural and ecological artifact of our Western Academy and all children and young pe people, um, if nurtured, um, are innately born as non-anthropocentric thinkers. Now that's a big claim, but, you know, and we need a lot more research and evidence, I suppose, to be able to convince people. But part of what I think is important in our, um, in our moving forward around the climate crisis is that we need to go back to validate that non-anthropocentric thinking, the unlearning of anthropocentrism. Because I think children, this emotional response that children have and the care that they feel for the earth is the tendrils of that non-anthropocentrism that they're born with, that innate connection that they have, that we are educating them out of. The second thing I think we need to be thinking about is in intergenerational thinking. Um, and this goes back to this idea that for many of the children, this sort of betrayal of government um, not responding and failing to act seems to be really central to how children are feeling right now. You know, and if we go back to like the speeches, you know, that we see that are happening um, with the, you know, the, um, the marches and millions of children all around the world joining to, you know, Greta Thunberg, for instance, for the Fridays for Future initiative, is that, you know, a lot of this is based on this idea that children feel that they've been lied to, they've been given false hope. Um, you know, and I think as Greta Thunberg says, you know, the house is on fire and, you know, when no one is doing anything about it. Um, so intergenerational thinking, I think, is essential to heal the planet and validate children's pain, um, in, especially in terms of their feelings of portrayal. Now, early in early in 2013, claimed we needed to nurture and educate about foresight intelligence, um, the ability to look ahead and act for the good of future generations, even if the short-term costs are involved. Um, they argued that rather than scientific and technological responses where hope is framed as faith in humans to find a solution, foresight intelligence encourages us to consider moral and ethical concerns about what is the right thing to do and what are the needs of future generations. Now, unfortunately, this whole idea of, you know, planning for future generations has been co-opted by sustainability and sustainability has just become another tool of, you know, Western society to say that don't worry, don't care, don't get emotional, it's irrational, science and technology has a way, we'll, we'll work it out, you know. Um, but this type of intelligence um, that Ehrlich and Ehrlich were talking about in 2013, which, as I said, they called it foresight intelligence, is now new literature that's coming out around intergenerational thinking, thinking that supports how you act now on behalf of those who will come after you, even though you might not reap the benefits in your own lifetime. 
And it seems that there's no generation with as much at stake who are willing to protest when it comes to the negative effects of climate change than the current generation of young people who seem to me to be very connected to this notion of intergenerational thinking. Um, in, um, in New Zealand, you know, a country very close to ours, and we do a lot of work with Indigenous Maori people of Aotearoa, and um, the Maoris have a term called wana, wanaka paka, and wanaka paka means um, that you believe that all living things, past, present and future, as well as all non-living entities like rivers, rocks and mountains, are born from the Sky Father and Earth Mother and are all related. And this kinship called wanaka paka, and from it stems the responsibility of tr protecting nature for the present and future generations. Maori people say knowing your Wanaka Pata and your link to place is important both as a mo motivator for the work you do and for the sense of responsibility to the place and the people of those who will come after you. So I think this sort of finding ways to reconnect in intergenerational thinking to the way children are feeling and giving them those tools is an important part of education. Finally, the last one, and I'll wrap it up now, hope and healing through enchantment. So non-anthropocentrism, nurturing non-anthropocentrism, supporting intergenerational thinking, and then how we consider hope and healing. In her book um, on hope and grief in the Anthropocene, Leslie Head argues, hope is not an optimistic effect, nor a utopian dream or a sunny disposition. Hope is practiced and performed. It's a sort of hybrid vernacular collective worked out in everyday practice and experience. Um, so how do we work towards hope um, and healing? Um, this this uh, list of sort of uh, working towards hope um, and addressing educators' fears comes and is adapted by um, looking through some of that research from Macy and O'Neill and Nicholson and Hathaway. And in this, I think about the sorts of um, things that educators tell me, but also some of my teach, you know, my students who are going out. And we've talked about this in some of our classes around um, sustainability and environmental education. And these are some of the things that, you know, I've identified, you know, this many teachers fear that by, you know, bringing up these questions around climate change is that they have a fear of feeling, um, appearing morbid, you know, being zealot, doomsday. Um, fear of expressing pain, not only um, opening up their own emotional pains, but also the pain of children, how to respond to the emotional um, feelings that children might have. The fear of guilt, many adults feel that they haven't done enough in action, the feelings of betrayal, um, we should have done something and we haven't, and I'm still doing not enough. Um, the fear of not knowing, you know, um, what what sort of questions do children ask? How do you respond to those questions? And also the fear of contributing to children's um, fear and anxiety by fueling the fire or adding to children's worries and concerns. So how can we respond to these fears that educators have how can we give them hope to work towards supporting children in climate change? Um, and I believe that hope is at the centre of it. I, I believe that hope carries for us um, an acknowledgement of the melancholy and grief that we have, but it also opens up possibilities and potential. It also supports a reframing of the of what the world requires and ruptures. And I'm I turn to sort of someone like. Um, uh, oh. Kima, what's her name? Uh, for anyway, yeah. Um, who asked the question of us? You know, what is the Earth asking of us um, right now? You know, how can we reframe the way we think about our connection? Hope isn't linear; it incorporates risks and failure. Is also about practice and experiment. For many, currently, the state of the world relays an image of precarity and disenchantment and, and in some ways devoid of hope. Um, Jane Bennett, responding to this image of disenchantment um, in modernity, asked not if this disenchantment is real, but rather whether the very characterization of the world is disenchanted, ignores and then discourages 
or allows effective attachment to the world. So in other words, she says, you know, if if we continue to create a sense of disenchantment, um, how can we effectively um, be, be connected to the world and attached to it? It sort of raises a question about our, our emotional response to the earth. To feel hope, enchantment, attachment and care, she argues, is important because the mood of enchantment, bringing back our sense of enchantment, may be the thing that helps us um, contribute to a more ethical life. In other words, what she's saying here is that, um, you know, if and, and she puts it in really plain terms in her book, you know, The Enchantment of a Modern Life, where she says, if you don't love the earth, how can, how can you have the ethical commitment to make a difference around what's going on? Um, so she sees this idea of enchantment as a way for us to reconnect Enchantment, she talks about, is, is the moment of its activation to assent wholeheartedly to life, not to this or that particular conditional aspects, but to the experience of living itself, being in the world. And she says it's a wonder, it's the wonder of minor experiences where the gift of enchantment purchases itself. And I'm really interested in this because I think instead of action, planting trees, vegetating, you know maybe hope is connected to enchantment joy wonder love care drawing on those um reconnections on thinking about how we can create this gift of hope and enchantment as a way for children to um, be able to see that there are possibilities and that possibility is about nurturing um what others may say is concern that I'm wanting to reframe as care. Um, when I showed you those pictures from Strife from 2012, one of the things that um, was really clear is that a lot of the research with children only continues to reiterate um, the doom and gloom. You know, how do you think the world will look like in 100 years? And then they realize it's going to be in flames. We're all going to die. Parents are going to die. When I was doing my research, um, instead of asking the children what they think the world would look like in 100 years, I asked them what do they dream and hope it will be in the hope to shift it to a discourse of hope and care. And this is, um, we also gave children cameras, and this is a photo actually taken by Rodriguez. He's age six and he lives in um, La Paz in Bolivia in a, in a village called Miniapata, which is on the high reaches of the valley. Now, um, the poorest people, unlike, you know, in Western society in, you know, in the low levels, you know, where you live on the hills so you can get the view, in La Paz, all the rich people live at the bottom of the valley and all the poor people live at the top because it's actually more prepared, precarious to live on the edges of the valley because you get landslides and such, but also because it's higher altitude, you know, it's 4,500 metres above sea level. So, you know, um, being up there, it can be precarious on your own health. But of course, one of the beautiful things about living on the high reaches of the valley is this, you know, this is what Rodriguez sees every day as he comes out of his house. And as he says here, you know, the Illumi mountain is in this photo and a view over the city of La Paz. I see Illumi from my house. When the sunshine hits the snow, it fills me with joy. Um, you know, and and places like Bolivar, you know, these are temperate glaciers, you know, they Elami is disappearing from his view of the world. Um, and so as a society, I think we need to work hard to help one another overcome depression, anxiety and fears. Yet what we urgently need is to reveal the truth, bear witness to the painful emotions that we are feeling about climate change. Um, that we should, and this sort of emotion, this this idea of creating hope and healing for children is to respond to the moral injury, injury, validate their feelings of loss of the planet they love and care for, you know, nurturing that wonder, love and joy. Um, and that this sort of should be informed by a vitalist ethics of responsibility and care. So vitalism is a form of life energy that all living things um, have have, must employ an ethics of human responsibility and diversity to ensure that we support the creative potential 
to overcome, you know, and direct our engagement through this sort of positive reciprocity and, and sense of responsibility. Um, so as we consider, you know, how can we respond to these profound emotions that children are feeling? And I, you know, think that we need to shift away and reframe that psychological sense. We need to understand that painful emotions, although they may be paralyzing, we can use these emotions to create create hope and healing. Um, and without these sort of modes of enchantment, we might not find we have the energy to enact the ecological projects or to contest the ugly and unjust modes of commercialization that we see around us to res respond generously to humans and non-humans, the challenge um, that is a, that we need to address is that we need to find enchantment in all the things that we find around us. Um, and that comes from Jane Bennett again around her notions of um, attachment and enchantment. This is um, another image um, from, semi, um, from Anna. She's 11 years. Again, um, these were the drawings that we asked children to draw of you know, how they would see the planet um, in the future, what their dreams were. And Anna lives um, in a very difficult environment in semi-plastics, semi-plastics in Kazakhstan, um, the city that she lives in uh, over a period of um, you know, 70 years of the Cold War. The Russian government detonated 460 nuclear bombs, many of them within close vicinity to the city. So children in this, um, this city live with those fears of radiation. But in her drawing, um, Anna says, this is my dream planet. I love animals, I, uh, mountains. I want anim mountains with snow. The snow would stop melting. I love nature and animals. I'd like to walk in the mountains with snow and take pictures of healthy animals. I want to swim underwater and see fish. I want to dance because of being so happy to be breathing fresh air and there would be no pollution. And another dream drawing from Australia, this is from Princess, she's age five. And she says, this is my drawing of my dream um, for the future. On the planet, all children and animals will be free and not die. So, Sort of some concluding thoughts. Um, to me, you know, what we need to do is reawake our spiritual connection to the earth. And I think that's the key to healing um, both ourselves, as Joanna Macy says, and the ecosystem. Climate anxiety can connect to, to many varying emotions, um, but education to support children in these precarious times should focus on the emotional and spiritual needs of children, not their psychological or mental health issues. So I think it's important that as educators and child and 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 people who do research with children and in the environment and nature realize that we need to provide an alternative voice to these psychological um, framings. Um, children's fear of the impending climate crisis is not fanciful or irrational. It's real and it needs to be validated and acknowledged not by them being made responsible to fix the problem, rather it involves governments taking responsibility and recognizing the impact of the climate crisis on children's future. Children growing up in Western society are closely connected to indigenous First Nations non-anthropocentric non thinking. They feel the loss. They feel the wedge between being driven through intuition that what the earth is saying to them is to care for the earth and it is about caring for yourself. To love the land is to love yourself as we are connected. Education needs to nurture this non-anthropocentric thinking, to unlearn some of the anthropocentrism that our education systems create. And through an understanding of how traditional owners of ancestral lands have come to adapt in many um, years to the changes in the environment over thousands of years. Today, many of our lethal threats build up over relatively long periods of time, posing a greater threat to future generations than ourselves. So myopia or short-sightedness encourages turning away a slow, invisible, unseen anthrop anthropocene. This kind of long-term thinking and planning for the future where children are asking 
for is urgently needed and children needed to be supported to engage in intergenerational thinking as humankind grapples with climate change and other ecological disasters, all of which have huge and irreversible um, impacts. By refusing anthropocentric thinking and supporting intergenerational thinking, children are opening up spaces for a vitalist ethic where care and responsibility for all life forms can thrive. By listening and recognizing and, and acknowledging children's suffering, by recognizing their sense of disenchantment, rather than a continued denial, we seek with children to find healing in the wonder and enchantment, every joy of being with the earth and come to move towards a mutual belonging where a new kind of power resides and a reawakening of our powerful emotions of gratitude, awe, beauty, love, and compassion. And I think we need to follow children in this. You know, um, it's not about educating them. It's about us being able to see that and validate that in children and, and continue to nurture and support them. A desire to love the world even more, to help them fight for hope and for its shared healing. And just as a final thought, um, George Monberg, I don't know if you're familiar with him, an environmental campaigner and journalist and writer from the UK who asks, if you feel at odds with the world, if your identity is troubled and frayed, if you feel lost and ashamed, it could be because you have retained the human values you were supposed to have discarded. And a final word uh, from my little uh, uh, supporter and friend, Elke. This will be right. I should be talking to you about it. Did you know that we're actually killing this planet? You know that. We're, we're killing the planet. We're putting rubbish on the planet. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. Yeah, we are. So, I don't know what we can do, but blah, blah. Bye. That's cool. That's it. Thank you.